The spirit of the St. Vrain Valley is about the land, the people, the stories and traditions that have become today's city of Longmont, Colorado. Through the efforts of more than 300 volunteers, this spectacular outdoor pageant was held in June of 1996 in the Jack Murphy Arena of the Boulder County Fairgrounds. Thousands of spectators enjoyed this celebration of the 125th anniversary of the founding of Longmont. Join us for the next hour as the spirit of the St. Vrain Valley tells the story. I am the spirit of the St. Vrain Valley. I am not a dream, a phantom, or a legend. I am a spirit, yes, but I am real. The great spirit conceived my valley. He varied and colored it. He sculpted my mountains. He populated my valley with living things and thus began the grand eternal drama. For many centuries, he has put a smile on the earth's face in my valley. For countless years, my valley was known only to the great spirit. The loneliness of the valley was made less lonely by the herds of deer, antelope, and buffalo that moved with the seasons in their relentless search for food. My valley began to mark time when human sounds invaded the silence of nature. The drums of the Ute, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho foreshadowed the coming of the white man. In the early 1800s, the trappers came with guns and steel traps to harvest my furs. Explorers seeking trails west passed through my valley as early as 1820. Major Stephen H. Long, with a troop of soldiers, crossed the barren plains of what he called the Great American Desert and gazed with awe at the mighty mountain peaks to the west. The towering giant, Long's Peak, bears his name today. In 1838, Siren St. Varane, an American from St. Louis, came to my valley to meet the challenge of the new west. Of French extract, he built a fort at the spot where a little blue stream flowed into the South Platte River from the southwest. It was called Fort St. Varane, and soon after the trappers and the Indians of the area began calling the stream by the same name. In time, the Arapahoes and the Cheyenne people who had called this valley home for so many centuries were pushed beyond the reaches of my valley. Gold seekers from the east rushed to my mountains and streams in a feverish search for shining nuggets of gold and instant wealth. Only a few remained to settle in my valley. Such a one was John Ramsey Rothrock, whose peace pact with the Arapaho permitted him to continue his search for gold. Rothrock, along with Captain Thomas Aiken and his party of prospectors, were traveling westward along the southern branch of the St. Varane when they were stopped by a band of Arapaho, led by Chief Niwot, who was also known by his American name of Left Hand. Why do you come? Does the white man come to kill our game, to burn our wood, to destroy our grass? Or are you here to live in peace? The white men counseled with each other. We have come so far. We cannot turn back now. Perhaps we can make friends with the chief. Let us give him some gifts. They offered Niwot some silver coins, a hunting knife, and a pack of tobacco. Left hand smoked the pipe of peace and made a promise. The Arapaho and the white man shall live together in peace, a covenant which he kept indeed. Chief Niwot continued to play the role of peacemaker for the rest of his life. My valley was soon to see prairie schooners inching their way over rutted trails, pulled by stubborn oxen, urged on by dauntless men and women. Through the dust and the heat, they struggled toward a vision of good grass and sweet water, some free land to till, and the promise of a hard but good life. By 1860, rough timber and sod homes dotted the valley and I watched with pride the changes that came slowly. The wooden plow that broke the sod, 
the first grains of wheat that were sown, the struggle against drought and the grasshopper. But the brave new friends continued to come to my valley. By 1860, their numbers climbed to 211 settlers. I remember the first white woman to settle in my valley, Amanda Franklin, the wife of B.F. Franklin, one of the early pioneer families to file a claim. Many other brave families bore the hardships of homesteading. I can tell you some strange and exciting changes were taking place in my valley, such as the time 25,000 cattle were driven over the plains. That was a grand sight. Determined men came searching for gold. Among them were Alonzo Allen and William Dickens. They built a cabin which was to mark the beginning of the little settlement of Burlington on the south bank of my river, just south of present Longmont. It seemed to spring up overnight, a hard-working group of settlers seeking to establish homes and industry. In the group were a few tradesmen, a doctor, a miller, a lawyer, and a freighter. Alonzo Allen was a real booster. He and his wife Mary were owners of the first eating place north of Denver. It was called the Allen House. The Allen House served the Burlington families in many ways even as the post office where Mary sorted and handed out mail. It became a meeting place where the settlers discussed their problems, but on Saturday nights, its doors were open to merriment as families joined in the laughter and the fun of square dancing. Four ladies promenade go inside of that ring. Come back home, swing your man, you swing that man and then. Join hands and circle left, you go walking around and then. Left out the man, and now you weave around the ring. While well, there's smoke on the water, on the land and on the sea. Go side though with your partner, all the way promenade. You promenade, go to buy two, it's all around you go. Promenade back home and now you settle right on down. Head couples promenade halfway around the ring. Come down the middle, right and left through, turn that little Jane. Square through and you go, four hands around in the middle you go. For the outside pair, right and left through, turn that girl you know. And dive through, square through and you go, three can hands around. Swing your corner and promenade. You promenade that ring, go walking around and then. Take your lady right back home and then you settle down. Head two couples promenade, go halfway around the ring. Come down the middle, right and up through and turn that little Jane. Square through, go, four hands around in the middle you go. With the outside pair, right and left through and turn that girl. You dive through, square through, go three hands and then swing your corner. Promenade again, you promenade that ring, go walking around with me. Promenade on home, and then you settle down. Four ladies promenade, go inside of that ring. Come back home and swing your man, you swing that man and then. Join hands and circle left, go walking around and then. Left out a man, come back and weave around the ring. Well, there's smoke on the water, on the land and on the sea. Go sado with a partner, then you promenade. Promenade, go two by two, it's all the way around. Promenade her right back home, and then you settle down. Side two couples, promenade, go halfway around the ring. Come down the middle, right and up through, and turn that little chain. You square through, go four hands around, and then four hands through, right and up through, turn that girl and then. You dive through, square through, three hands around, you go. Swing your corner, and then you promenade. You promenade, go around the ring, it's all the way, and then take her right back home, and then you settle down. Side two couples promenade, it's halfway around. Come down the middle, right and left through, and turn that girl you found. Square through, go, four hands around, and then right and left through the outside, too, and turn the girls and men. Dive through, square through, three hands around you go. 
swing with the corner lady now, then you promenade, promenade, go around the ring all the way, and then you take your partner right back home, and then you settle down. Four ladies, promenade, go inside that big old ring. Come back home and swing your man, you swing him round, and then join hands, circle left, go walking around the ring. Left out a man, come back and weave around the ring. Well, there's smoke on the water, smoke on the sea. Dosado with your partner and promenade for me. You promenade, go round the ring, all the way you go. Promenade, you take her home and then bow real low. Yeah, all right. In 1870, many miles away in Chicago, important decisions were being made. Horace Greeley was urging, go west, young man, and grow up with the country. On November 22nd, a group of successful businessmen and leaders in their communities met in Farwell Hall to form a colony in the west. These leaders were not looking westward with the hopes of increasing their fortunes. They chose to leave the security of their homes and flourishing businesses to form a new community in an area that offered a healthful climate and the promise of rearing their children into adulthood, free from the consumption, the tuberculosis, which racked the cities of the East. If Horace Greeley and the New York Times can back an undertaking like this, why can't we? We must go west if we are to escape the dread scourge that is stalking our families. He's right. Each year the consumption is claiming more lives of our children. We must take them where the air is pure and the sun is warm year round. I agree. Our children must have a chance to live. I hear the climate is warm and dry in the West. I favor a move. We can build up a new community and set up our own standards. We can do it. The West is anybody's territory. I'm willing to take my family there. The United States needs to grow. We need more beef. I've heard that wheat yields 60 bushels to an acre on the irrigated lands. I don't know much about farming, but I'm willing to give it a try for the sake of my family. I move we act at once. I nominate Reverend Robert Collier as president. I second the motion. On January 23, 1871, I was to witness the beginning of an era of excitement in my valley. The committee from Chicago arrived in the Burlington settlement to choose land for their city. In their search, they found no region which pleased them as much as my valley. They were delighted with the beautiful scenery and were impressed with the climate and the good soil. They saw that with great effort, they could use the water resources of the mountains to bring irrigating canals and reservoir lakes. This would be the colony site for hundreds of families that gambled all for a new future and a new lease on life. The Chicago, Colorado colony claimed it, lock, stock, and barrel, and the move westward began by railroad. By the end of the month, the first colonists arrived. At a meeting of the Valley settlers, the colonists at Burlington Schoolhouse, 50 memberships were sold at $150 each to the Burlington settlers. A vigorous controversy arose over the name of the new town site, but the dispute was finally settled when Seth Terry, suggested that the town be called Longmont after the mighty mountain peak, the bold landmark of my valley. So Longmont became the new home for the Chicago colony. The Chicago colony deeds specifically stated that no wine, beer, ale, malt, whiskey, or other spirituous liquor shall be served, sold, used, or dispensed on the property. If it was, the property would revert back to the Chicago Colony Administration. Longmont was to be a strict temperance community, in contrast to the wide open mining communities, which boasted wild women and roaring taverns like Boulder. The Chicago colonists brought their business skills and practical know-how with them. In the first three months, they spent $50,000 
erecting entire business sections. By July of 1871, there were 70 houses in the new Longmont. They were not content to farm as the valley pioneers did along the river bottoms and creek beds. They built an extensive system of ditches which became the lifeblood of the entire farming area. With great forethought, they surveyed streets in a mild wide plan from First Avenue to Ninth Avenue, from Martin Street to Bowen. They constructed parks. The Chicago colony built their city around their slogan, industry, temperance, morality. And only the rugged ones stayed on and continued to build. I saw many quit and go back home. The struggle was too great. My valley was to absorb much from the tremendous spirit and the effort of the early Chicago colonists. What kind of man was this early colonist? Here's a portrait of one of them. Listen to the man himself, Seth Terry. My resolve to go west was no sudden impulse. From my youth, I desired to go into a new country and have a hand in the building up rather than sit down and enjoy the fruits of somebody else's labor. I left my wife and family and my successful career back in Rockford, Illinois to help locate the Chicago colony just east of Long's Peak. What a great responsibility rested on the shoulders of a few of us, but we did what we felt was best for all. The frontier years of Longmont were marked with vigorous growth. I watched it become a trading center for the whole St. Brain Valley. More buildings were erected and businesses established. A new post office, the livery stable, the newspaper, the Longmont Sentinel, Bellman's Carriage Company, Fox Green Mill, a harness shop, a hotel, Emerson Bank, a blacksmith, the grocery store, and the St. Verain Mill. If a building were not completed, business just took place in the street. In June of 1871, Seth Terry received a letter from Mrs. Elizabeth Thompson. She had purchased 25 colony memberships to give to friends and acquaintances. Miss Thompson mentioned that she intended to come to the new colony shortly and expected that there would be a suitable building in place for the colony meetings. Mr. Terry and the colony officers met with Chauncey Stokes, a carpenter. Construction began on a Tuesday at 325 Pratt Street. By Thursday of the following week, they had the building enclosed, the floor laid, the bell ringing, and the flag floating when Mrs. Thompson arrived on the evening stagecoach. This building became the first public library in Colorado. Mrs. Thompson paid the $2,000 and donated the books for the library. It became known as Library Hall. An elegant celebration was planned in Mrs. Thompson's honor. The ladies of the town were in charge of the occasion, a strawberry festival. This called for strawberries, which had to be ordered out of town. Imagine the disappointment and the panic when they failed to arrive, but the day was saved when a few jars of canned strawberries were stretched over dishes of homemade ice cream. The Chicago colonists were to see setbacks, too. I saw tragedy hit the new town. It crept like a thief in the night on September 8, 1879. The fire originated in a bakery run by two young men who carelessly fell asleep while live coals and the building became destroying flames. The alarm was spread, but too late. The fire raged while townspeople fought to save their businesses. The water used for irrigation had been shut off by some farmer, and the ditches were all dry. A bucket brigade formed at the city pump on the west side of 4th and Main. But by sunrise, part of the east half of the Longmont's business section were hot, smoldering ashes. The disaster was great but the spirit and determination of my people were greater. An ordinance was passed prohibiting the erection of frame buildings, so they rebuilt with brick. They developed an adequate water system 
a hook and ladder truck, and firemen's uniforms were presented to the town by Emerson and Buckingham. By 1882, an abundant supply of water was delivered in pipes from the St. Verain Creek to the homes. Come see where over 90 companies soar with eagles. The Pratt Management Company has over 2 million square feet of advanced industrial high-tech facilities right here in Longmont, Colorado. The park is home to more than 6,000 people, providing jobs and recreation, all set in a pleasing environment. Pratt Management Company is proud to bring you this coverage of Longmont's 125th anniversary parade and pageant. What makes a community great? Clearly, it's the people that live there, the folks who work there, and the contributions we all make to improve the quality of life. For years, we've been providing our schools with educational programming. We've sponsored community programs that make a difference in people's lives. We entertain you, we inform you, and we thank you. Scripps Howard Cable, television with you in mind. Citizens of Longmont entered into the spirit of the gay 90s with gusto. One of the big attractions of the era was Pumpkin Pie Day. Early in that day, all avenues of the city were jammed with vehicles, bringing friends and their country cousins to the big celebration at Thompson Park. Those beautiful trees in that park were kept alive all of these many years by townswomen who carried pails of water from the river. Entertainment was supplied by a band, not a brass band, but a German silver band that was one day to play a concert on the top of Long's Peak, just for the hell of it. Trains from every direction brought our first tourists to join the fun. Some 6,000 pumpkin pies were baked, 500 gallons of coffee were brewed, and barrels of cider enticed the visitors. The festivities began with a parade, and what a parade, a mile and a half long. Everyone, young and old, got into the parade. Then the pumpkin pies were served. In the afternoon, trotting horse races drew the excited crowd to Roosevelt Park. In the early twilight hours, the men gathered in groups and harmonized until weary families called goodnight and another pumpkin pie day became a memory. The sugar beet had come to my valley in 1870, and by 1900, more farmers became interested in this crop. Sugar beets called for the proper irrigation, and farmers soon began to explore the best ways of bringing plenty of water to the beet fields. The sugar factory was built in 1903. This proved to be a great bonus to our growing economy. Make no mistake, Longmont is here because of farming. The railroad, the hardware store, the blacksmith, the banks, the mills, those and other businesses. And the people who worked in them were here because of the farmer. Agricultural drew many new faces to the valley. New nationalities were becoming prominent. From Sweden came early settlers who claimed homesteads west of Longmont and east at Wren. In the 1870s, they came and they proved to be excellent farmers and dairymen. In the 1880s came many Danes and Norwegians. There were also the Russian Germans arriving from 1904 till 1914. Industrious and devout, many of these families are still prosperous farmers today. Japanese farmers were attracted to my valley bringing their knowledge and skill, always contributing much to the progress of the community. A large number of Hispanics returned after their forefathers had explored my valley 
and they merge their culture and their industry with Longmont's growth through the years. All of these nationalities have blended their cultures and contributed greatly to make Longmont a more interesting, diverse, tolerant, and progressive community. After the turn of the century, Longmont started reaching out in many new directions. Local citizens looked with pride upon the new Longmont Hospital and the new Brick High School. In 1904, the first sewer pipes were laid and the town began to take on city airs. The Zweck Hotel, the Dickens Opera House, the Masonic Temple, the Odd Fellows Hall, and City Hall added dignity to the architecture of the town. Favorite plays like Uncle Tom's Cabin, East Lynn, and Ten Nights at a Bar Room were performed to full houses. It's even possible that the famed Barrymores played the Dickens Opera House as a part of the Great Silver Circuit. Picture shows were beckoning young couples to the electric theater. Many young swains, spurred on by the romance of these dramatic productions, stalled their horse and buggy purposely <laughs> on the way home with their lady loves. Whoa, whoa, Bess. Hope you don't mind if I rest my horse's spell. Why should I mind, Harry? Well, I may as well confess. I stopped just in order to look at you, Mabel. Then I do mind, Harry. But it's so hard to see your eyes when I'm looking at the road. Why, Mabel, you're blushing. Am I? No kidding? Yeah. On you, it looks pretty. I'm not blushing. It's just the heat. I'm, I'm very warm, that's all. Well, whatever it is, you're very beautiful tonight. I'm glad you think so, Harry. Mabel, would you be offended if I kissed you? Kissed me? Yes. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I mean, no, I wouldn't be offended. I, why? Thank you. Harry, uh, you want to know something? What, Mabel? That was the first time in my life I've ever been kissed. You want to know something? What, Harry? This is the second. 
Yep, these young fellers knew how to court their girls. And soon wedding bells were announcing a new family was being established in Longmont. Fourteen Longmont High School players with, Judge, with Coach Roy Coffin arrived in Denver by train to play against the renowned team from Chicago's Inglewood High School. A foot and a half of snow had fallen in Denver. To clear off the field, they spread a thick layer of straw on the field, doused it with kerosene, and set the straw to blazing. The result was slush and mud, but the game was called at the scheduled time. Most of Longmont's population had come to Denver on a special train to see the game, and they got their money's worth. A string of world champs. This never-to-be-forgotten sports spectacle had left its mark. For Longmonters are sports-minded enthusiasts who urged their teams on to victories. First, the team was called the Longmont High football players. Later on, the beet diggers. Then, the pie eaters. Today, they are the Trojans. But there are now five more high schools. The Erie Tigers, the Lions Lions, Frederick Warriors, Skyline Falcons, and Niwot Cougars. The high school sports remain an important part of life in my valley. Teams of boys and girls continue to participate, frequently winning, sometimes losing, but always trying their best. My spirit flows through these young people. My colonists responded early to the religious needs of its people, eternally grateful for their new homes in the valley and the success of their efforts in organizing their community, they set about building places of worship, a strong component of the spirit of my valley.
daily social lives of the people of Longmont and its surrounding farms and ranches centered around the schools, churches, and such worldly affairs as the box social, the literary, the spelling bee, and the square dance. Many is the swain who met his lady love at one of these doings and courted her over her elaborately decorated box of fried chicken and other delicacies. Later, we had the Jitney. This popular dance hall still exists in Roosevelt Park, and it can lay claim to being the place where many couples from Longmont and the surrounding towns had their first dance. Everyone loved dancing to the sound of Joe Cook's orchestra. It was an affordable event, too. Eight cents admission per couple, thanks to the generous contributions of the American Legion. see where over 90 companies soar with eagles. The Pratt Management Company has over 2 million square feet of advanced industrial high-tech facilities right here in Longmont, Colorado. The park is home to more than 6,000 people, providing jobs and recreation, all set in a pleasing environment. Pratt Management Company is proud to bring you this coverage of Longmont's 125th anniversary parade and pageant. Longmont has a four-lane main street whose dimensions were so thoughtfully laid out by the original Chicago, Colorado colonists. It easily lends itself to one of the city's most time-honored evening activities, dragging Maine or cruising. The idea of being able to drive side by side with friends and acquaintances, you in one car and them in another, holding conversation regarding the deepest philosophical hypothesis of the day, impeding traffic at a rate of 5, 10, or 15 miles per hour, is simply too tempting to pass up for any teenager, young or old. What more could you ask for? The chance to meet old friends or make new ones, show off your car or motorcycle, and defy an all-knowing parent's admonition to stay off Main Street on Friday and Saturday night, all for the price of a few gallons of gas. Why Main Street has been the center of weekend activity since the town was brand new. We wouldn't think of breaking such a long-standing tradition, would we, Chief Butler? There have been other traditions which have captured the imagination of Longmonters. Cheaper Charlie Harris, who owned a local parts dealership, had an old tin shed at the corner of 9th and Hover that he used for storage. 
it had somewhat deteriorated over the years, and there were some who thought had it, it had become an eyesore. One dark night, six civic-minded citizens decided to take matters into their own hands. If the feeling was that the little building was ugly, they considered it their civic duty to help beautify the local landscape. Bob and Harriet Grigsby, Frank and Lee Flanders, and Dick and Jeanette Klein spent days planning their caper. It was important to select just the right shade of bright purple paint. The Purple Gang, as they came to be called, rendezvoused at the Grigsby home. By the next morning, the bedraggled little shed sported a new coat of dazzling purple paint. The Times Call published photos. The police department searched for the perpetrators, and the shed took on a new use that made it more notable than ever than it ever would have been had it remained just a beat-up old storage shed. Cheaper Charlie's shed at 9th and Hover soon became a community bulletin board. Someone painted happy birthday to a daughter or son. Someone else painted go Trojans, exhorting one of the local high school teams to victory. Charlie's shed uh, has given us something no other community had. But of course, all good things must come to an end. The shed was eventually torn down by the Peak Two classes at Longs Peak Junior High, who sold pieces of it to the benefit of charity. It became a memory and a reminder of the joy and community spirit that makes Longmont unique. Citizens of Longmont can take advantage of hundreds of acres of city parks with picnic facilities, tennis and basketball courts, walking trails, bike paths, and fitness courses. Our baseball and softball facilities are second to none. Golfers have their choice of three city courses as well as Fox Hill Country Club. Union Reservoir provides a place for fishing, swimming, and boating. And an indoor and outdoor swimming pool makes swimming available all year round. If Longmonters are not involved in some kind of recreational activity, it's certainly not due to the lack of facilities. But we in the St. Brain Valley have never had to rely on governmental entities for the things that make life richer and more enjoyable. The spirit of the community that carried the colony members through those first difficult years still infuses today's residents. There has never been a shortage of selfless, generous people who shared what they have for the good of the community. Due to this spirit of philanthropy, Longmonters have been blessed with things that other communities can only dream about. There's the St. Brain Greenway, Golden Ponds and Rogers Grove along the river. There's Clark Centennial Park. There's Jim Han Nature Center given by the family of a young Longmont man lost in Vietnam. There's the New Hope Cancer Center at Longmont United Hospital. The Longmont Community Foundation has raised a large sum of money to help many community projects. It seems that wherever there's a need, whenever there's a need, somebody steps forward. That's the spirit of the St. Brain Valley. One of the most exciting examples of this attitude is the coming of Front Range Community College to Longmont. The colony founders who platted the space for a college in the plan of the original square mile would be mighty proud. It took the efforts and lives of many pioneers through these past 125 years to fulfill the dream of the Chicago colony. Their names are treasured in our history and are a lasting memorial to the spirit of my valley and of Longmont. The wide streets were given the names of the Chicago colony founders, Collier, Bross, Emery, Bowen, Terry, Pratt, Kaufman, Gay, Kimbark. Although some of these men never lived in Longmont, 
their imprint on our city can never be erased. Yes, Seth Terry, your labor of love in my valley planted the roots and built the foundations for Longmont. Yes, we are all the spirit of the St. Vrain Valley. We are Longmont, and for 125 years, we have been the pulse of the tremendous growth which has taken place here. We rejoice in the abundant life which we have been privileged to enjoy. It has taken the combined efforts of all of our leaders, our planners, our laborers, of our youth, and the wisdom of our senior citizens. Longmont has continued to grow and prosper because of our school children. Little leaguers, boy scouts, girl scouts, 4-H members, teachers, farmers, business people, lawyers, doctors, nurses, dentists, engineers, production workers, clerks, salespeople, church leaders, artisans, musicians, truck drivers, police and fire departments, administrators, senior citizens, and our clubs and organizations. The Chicago, Colorado Colony's motto was industry, temperance, morality. For the next 125 years, let's make our motto industry, tolerance, morality. May you continue to walk the soft earth of my valley as friends to all who live here. And may the St. Brain Valley and the city of Longmont continue to be a shining monument of opportunity for all who work and play here.